The first thing to know about me as a musician is that I have a, a huge musical palette. Like I, I grew up listening to uh, a lot of different genres of music. I'm a 80s baby, but cut my teeth in the 90s. So I listened to hip hop, Wu-Tang, Tribe Called Quest, like, you know, but also Lenny Kravitz and, you know, my dad, uh, he was a musician himself. So we always had music around, very musical family. And he, he introduced me to Jimi Hendrix at a, as a youth. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. You know, this is awesome. I just want people, like, when they listen to my music and even see me as a performer, just know that it may not just be all straight ahead jazz. It may not be all hip hop. It's going to be a conglomerate, conglomeration or an amalgamation of all of those things. Well, for me, the difference between playing in front of an empty theater and a live audience is more so just the interaction, the energy that you get from people. Even if they're not saying anything, it's still the energy um, that we as musicians feed off of. Um, so it's almost like you have to adjust your mind to imagine, you know, the, uh, the audience to keep, you know, keep the same level of energy in the performance as you would if there was, you know, thousands of people in the audience.
Well, some of my primary guitar influences actually, um, to be honest, although I, you know, listen to, you know, Lenny and Kravitz, I actually started playing guitar. Uh, I was a late bloomer, not until my senior year in high school. And um, it's, it's funny how, you know, all those things that you listen to kind of still, they still sit with you and come out. But um, when I got to college, I started listening to an artist named Grant Green, really heavy, because he was he was simple enough for me to kind of get, but he played, you know, with a certain level of swing, and I started getting into jazz, and then Miles Davis and all this other stuff. The Council of Elders record pays uh, tribute to Wes Montgomery, Kenny Burrell, Grant Green, and George Benson. Now. <clears throat> I don't know any guitar player that would ever have anything bad to say about George Benson. He's like the greatest guitar player ever. But um, at, at, at an early at early stage, I couldn't grasp all the stuff that he was doing. So I started with Grant Green, then I went to West, then I went to Kenny Burrell. So the 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 record just whenever you know I'm searching for inspiration or whatever, I always lean on those guys because they encompass you know the blues, jazz modern music, pop, all of that stuff is, is, is in uh, their playing. So that's what I aspire to, 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 to be and get out of my playing as well.
I've played, you know, neo soul gigs with, you know, Music Soul Child, or you know, um, gigs with Monica, R&B gigs, gospel. Currently, you know, um, I'm on staff at uh, Bishop Paul S. Morton. He's a huge gospel uh, artist, Stella Award winner, and everything. At the end of the day, I always say jazz music. I, I, I tell people I'm a jazz musician because jazz encompasses, you know, gospel, j blues. Uh, hip hop, R&B, all of those things. So it's great to be in those different different playing situations um, because it just adds more to what I can bring on the stage. A lot of people don't may not listen to jazz, but when they hear Rod Harris Jr. or when they see me perform, I want them to take something away from the performance that they can recognize, you know, as, as we just did, a, the, you know, just did the show, you know, taking a song like I Can't Tell You Why by the Eagles, you know, and still putting my own twist on it based on my influences. Um, but I just, th those artists that I've previous or previously performed with and um, occasionally still do shows with, um, they, they, I'm always getting something. I'm always listening. <laughs> always listening.
I think the, the first thing I would say to aspiring musicians is number one, don't give up, especially in times like, <laughs> like today, uh, um, because you know there's always light at the end of the tunnel, even if you feel like one day you make a, I, I, I don't know any serious musician who, who doesn't have bouts with, you know, um, like doubt, self-doubt, uh, Sometimes you wake up like, what am I doing? This is not making me any money. I'm broke. Like, you know, you're gonna, you might have some financial struggles uh, at times, but at the end of the day, um, as long as you're creating, you're never broke. You know, as long as you, at least in your mind, um, you, you just keep pushing and to the, to the, you know, aspiring students, just keep pushing. Um, don't give up. I know that's very cliche, but it'll pay off. If you're serious about what you do um, or what you're doing, then it'll eventually pay off. I came in as a music student here at Georgia State, but I also, I ended up graduating with a business degree um, and, you know, kind of <clears throat> minored in music. But music was always there. So even though I was, you know, working as a business analyst, you know, for Bank of America, I was in my car practicing in my mind, I already knew this is not the, the end for me. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it at, at some level <laughs> as a musician, you know? So I just tell them to keep everybody, like students that I have, just keep pushing, keep learning, keep shedding, keep practicing, when I say shedding, practicing, and it'll happen for you if, if, if that's what you desire, you know? People have to have a certain trust for each other, you know? And then people become necessary to each other. So when I went over and played with the white kids, then I listened to the music they were listening to. And I also, when I went on the other side of the tracks to play with the black kids, then I heard the blues coming out of somebody's house or went to church and you heard that. So I think wherever you grow up, you know, you can go somewhere else, but you never really leave that place. You know, it goes with you, the good and the bad. If you're looking through the window instead of looking in that mirror, then 
and there's a certain amount of memory in there, and a certain amount of, of what comes out of you is just exploration. You know? and there are no physical parts. You're just trying to grab something out of the air, an idea or uh, something, and you realize that a lot of it's just trying to solve the riddle of life. You know?
as a kid uh, in, you know, in the 90s and, and when I first started listening to hip hop music, um, I was more so intrigued by the beats and the, and the, the sounds um, and also how the, the rapper was kind of like bouncing off of you know, off of the, the rhythm, rhythms of the beats. And then I started to, like, as I got older, learning jazz and delve, delving more into that genre of music, I've find, like, I, I guess I've finally realized that uh, they were sampling, the hip hop producers were sampling the jazz records and sampling a lot of the, you know, old school funk records and stuff. So um, it, it was pretty much a no brainer for me to bridge the gap, you know, because I, I want my music to connect with a younger audience as well as an older audience. And considering that, you know, jazz w is pretty much the foundation of hip hop and, you know, in its truest form, um, I was like, well, let me take some of these jazz samples as, as with El Presidente, um, which was the, uh, it's the first track on the Exodus and Options record. It takes the sample that uh, Eric B and Rakim, and it's, it's, you know, some people are like El Presidente. We thought it was a Spanish song or something like that, but um, but it's it stands for the president. Eric B was uh, Eric B and Rakim. They had a group together. The first, I think, the first record or first single was called Eric B for President because he produced the song. Um, so uh, I took a, a sample from the 1994 recording, "Don't Sweat the Technique." and um, wrote a jazz melody over it to try to bring back, kind of like full circle, the relationship between hip hop and jazz. Playing in you know, bands like the Royal Crunk Jazz Orchestra, which has a lot of hip, hip hop jazz influences, it, it really, um, it's just in my DNA. You know, we have this, this thing uh, called the, the Groyd Academy and Russell Gunn is like the dean of the Groyd Academy, but the Groyd Academy is just, it's, it's like the, the mixture of hip hop and funk and like jazz and all of that stuff. Um, so with X's and options, that's that's the the, the primary, uh, I guess, premise of that record. You know, it's just mixing the hip hop and the jazz. So all of my stuff, um, when when it comes out, you can go to all the internet stores, um, but you can also go to my website, www.rodharrisjr.com. It will have all the dates, performance dates as well. Um, so you can find out where me and the band will be playing next. Thank you all very much for joining uh, this live stream. I'd like to thank the Rialto Center for Performing Arts. I'd like to thank uh, all the staff. Um, we got Mr. Lewis Haribo on piano. Mr. Tommy Sauter is on bass. Dave Potter on drums. My name is Rod Harris Jr. We're going to play one more song off of my most recent uh, EP entitled Exes and Options, and this is El Presidente.
Once again, thank you all very much. Lewis Haravo, Dave Potter, Tommy Sauter. My name is Rod Harris, Jr. God bless you all.